Now, if you remember, we started this mini-series in the little book of Jude. And uh, if you don't know where Jude is, that is the book, book before the last book in the Bible. Okay? The last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. And Jude is a book that has just one chapter just before, just before uh, the book of Revelation. And we'll go, we'll be going back to that book today, all right? Uh, because you know, on the first Sunday of the month, I told you that Jude wrote this book to confront one of the issues that was affecting the Christian church or corrupting the Christian church will be the best word to use. Because uh, uh, we saw that there are three areas where it can be attacked and the gospel message can be corrupted. One was uh, uh, through the area of legalism. And we covered about legalism last Sunday and we uh, looked at in detail why legalism is bad and why legalism does not represent the true gospel as the Bible teaches us. And the second area is what I'm going to talk about today, which is the opposite of legalism, which is liberalism, where the church comes to a conclusion that it doesn't matter how, how do you live, it doesn't matter what do you believe, anything goes, you know, that kind of an attitude. Then the th there's a third area where the church was attacked in the first century, which is even true for even today, is that, uh, is that uh, the wrong spiritual concept, we called it spiritualism, where we saw uh, in, the new, uh, in, the new, in, the, in, in our days it is New Age beliefs and other, other counterfeit spiritualities that is coming and infiltrating into the Christian church, okay? Uh, today we will be talking about liberalism. The, the issue that actually Jude addressed in this little book was the liberalism issue. Now, uh, in the first century church, there were three, these three issues were there, and three books in the Bible talked about that. Last week, we looked at a quarter a little bit from the book of Galatians, and where, which was written to address the issue of legalism that uh, the first century church faced. And, and uh, the book of Colossians, which we'll look at next Sunday, is actually a book written against the counter spiritual spiritual. Uh, uh, spirituality that was trying to infiltrate into the church. The book of Jude was actually written against uh, the liberalism that was creeping into the church. The church was in existence only for about 50 years, but in within 50 years, the church got affected by different things because one generation comes and they move on, another generation comes and, and the eyewitnesses of the gospel, eyewitnesses to the life and death of Jesus Christ were all gone. And now there's a new generation, you know, um, attending the church and the Christianity is growing as a religion, but uh, the new generation of leaders were not eyewitnesses to the life or death of Jesus Christ. They never had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. They only heard from the apostles who were with Jesus. So, so some people started questioning them, and then they started saying, no, you guys are not right, and this is what we should be. And then everyone started bringing in their own ideas into the Christian faith. And before you knew, Christian faith became a must. Okay, there were a lot of confusion, unfortunately, from the, from the end of the first century, at least through the end of uh, the third century, until the Bible was put together like the way we have it today. So there were a lot of questions. Now, today when you look at, uh, look at, uh, look at the, the TV, and they talk about the gospel of uh, Magdal Mary Magdalene, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, and all these things, you know, it was there, it was there. It, it propped up during that time when there was confusion about Christian faith because they did not have the Bible like we have. You know, we, the, the, the books in the Bible were already written, but they were not put together. And there were questions about what is divinely inspired and what is not divinely inspired. And that, that continued until the third uh, century. Now today, a lot of people uh, talk, uh, say that uh, uh, it was Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who put the Bible together. That's not true. That's so false. Emperor Constantine had uh, nothing to do with it except uh, addressing certain issues about canonicity. Um, actually, it was, uh, it was the bishops uh, who put, bishops of the Christian church, who put the Bible together. Okay, so they say, 
you know, today there is, it has become fashionable to attack Christianity, attack Bible. So you will see television shows after television shows saying that, oh, King Constantine or Emperor Constantine selected certain books and he said, okay, this is the Bible and that's why you have this book today. That's not true. That's not so, so not true. Um, if you want to study more about that, I had put together something about that, a lengthy uh, piece of material with a lot of evidence and stuff. I do not know if I can, I, I can still find it. If I can find it, uh, I, will, I can make copies of that for you. Actually, it was a, as a DVD uh, when they produced that book, Da Vinci Code, remember? That everyone was getting on that bandwagon, so we did a, a, a very in-depth study to, to come against that and to counter the arguments that was presented in that book, okay? So there, there were issues in Christianity. And, and, but now, in the 21st century, as I have said last two Sundays, we see the same three strain of attacks coming against the Christian church all over again. On one side, there, is, there was legalism coming. Certain circles are, uh, are, are so adapted into that. Uh, and, and they said, they think that they are the only Christians in the world. Nobody else is a Christian. And, and then you see liberalism coming into the church, which I will talk about today. And then we see all these counterfeit spiritualities coming and saying that, oh, nothing special about, uh, about Christianity. We are just like Christianity. We believe in Jesus Christ, this and that. I will address that issue tomorrow, next Sunday. So if you can come back, come back next Sunday, all right? I will look at it in detail. Now, the book of Jude, this little book of Jude is, uses very strong language. You know, Jude is very passionate in the, in the phrases that he used, in the language that he used. And, uh, and, and I was wondering when I was preparing this message, why this man got so passionate about this? Why was he so adamant against standing against this? And, and actually it didn't start with Jude, it started with Jesus Christ because Jude understood, I mean, it was Jesus who taught us that a little yeast, it takes only a little yeast to leaven the whole lump. Leaven the whole lump. Amen? Now, today, today we go to a store, right? Pathmark or some other, some other store and buy a little package of yeast. And uh, when you are cooking something, right, moms in this audience, you put that yeast in there and the next morning you see the the, the lump just expands, right? It, uh, it uh, expands and sometimes you see five times bigger than what you originally had in there. And, uh, uh, and so that, that, it is, that yeast is so powerful that you just put a little bit in there, it affects everything. You know, the whole batter you had in that pot. Now, in the days of Jesus, they did not have yeast, yeast in a little packet. You know, everyone knew about yeast, but they didn't know the science behind yeast. So they did not have yeast in a little package. You know how they, how they, uh, how they uh, made uh, uh, bread at that time? That's where they used the yeast mostly. They, what they do was they will always take a little bit of leavened bread. You know the batter that is already leavened? And after they make the bread, bake the bread or whatever they do, they will always leave a little bit behind, a little bit of dough that is already leavened behind and when they make the fresh dough they just put this old dough into it and just mix it up and that little bit of old dough had enough yeast in there to affect all of that fresh dough and and uh, that's how they made even now you know some bakeries make bread like that sourdough bread that's why it's called sourdough bread that's how they make it they take the, they take a little bit of Leaven dough and put into fresh dough until it affects the entire thing and then they make the bread. So that's why in the Bible, in the book of 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that we must celebrate our victory, our salvation, just like the Old Testament Israel celebrated the unleavened, the feast of the unleavened bread. Now, we have talked about how they celebrate the feast of the unleavened bread on previous occasions here. Um, you know, my wife is working in, in, in nutrition department for about 35 years or more. Now, ever since she was a teenager, she has been working in that department. And, and most of, more, 
So now you know she's more than 35 years old. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm in big trouble today. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, you know, most of her life, she worked in Jewish nursing homes. And the Jewish nursing home, it's so interesting. The Passover is a big thing. You know that. We all know that. It's a big thing for them. But not only the Passover, the, new, the festival of the unleavened bread also is a big thing for them. So during, the, during that Passover week, they actually clean the whole place, rub, scrub the whole wall, you know, scrub everything in the kitchen, including the ceiling, the wall, the whole thing. And everything is washed with bleach and, and, and water and soap. And, and, and to make sure they kill every little bit of yeast that is left in that kitchen. They're so particular. And then, even then they are not satisfied. You know what they do? The final thing is the rabbi will come with a blowtorch. And he will burn, literally he will put that blowtorch against the wall, every inch of that wall, to make sure that every last living particle of yeast is killed. So that's how particular they were that in, in celebrating the unleavened bread. Amen? Now we know that yeast is a, it's a symbol of sin in the Bible. Amen? So if that is how God expects us to celebrate our victory, which is not once a year, which is a daily thing, what is God telling us? God is telling us that there is absolutely no room for sin in our lives. And we know that many times we fail in that area. That's why Bible tells us that, okay, then you come back to the cross. Get right with God. Don't, don't present a blind eye to what happened. Confront it, confront it, address it, come to the cross, take care of it, and then move on. That's the, what Bible teaches us. Amen? Now, liberalism is the opposite of that. That's why the Bible says we must stand against liberalism. And Jude wrote this little book about it. Because liberalism is against that, opposite that. What, is liberal, what does liberalism say? Liberalism says it doesn't matter. You know, eh, that's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. Don't, don't take that too seriously. Don't fret over that. Kids will be kids. People will be people. You know, that argument is what Jude was fighting against. And let me tell you why Jude was fighting against that. In the first century, there was a group of people called the Gnostics. You know, they, they called themselves the educated folks of the first century. You know, they were all philosophers. Every one of them considered themselves a philosopher. You know, philosophy was the science of the first century. So every one of them considered themselves a philosopher, and they all claimed to possess secret knowledge about how body and uh, spirit works. See, the problem with the Gnostics or Gnosticism was that uh, they gave all the importance to the spirit no importance to the body. In other words, they said, uh, your spirit is the thing that lives forever, which we all agree. See, this is where the, the, the counterfeit comes in. You know, the, the, a half-truth is always more dangerous than a total lie, because uh, half-truth can defeat a lot more people than a total lie. Remember what, what Satan did when, when he came into the Garden of Eden? He, he presented a half-truth to defeat uh, Eve. So the same way, the Gnostics said, okay, it is your spirit that lives forever, which all of us agree, it is our spirit that lives forever. But then they turned around and said, uh, your body is perishable, which we agree, which also we agree. So they said, since your body perishes, you don't have to worry about what you do in your body. Doesn't count. See, as long as your spirit is redeemed, what is done in your body is not important. That's what they said. And that became a perversive thinking in the first century. So a lot of people adopted that. Now, uh, carnality became very rampant in the first century. And most of the, the Gentile worship systems at that time actually had a temple prostitution attached to that. In other words, you went to, into the temple, you gave your offering, and as part of your worship experience, you also had an opportunity to go and have a relationship with the temple prostitutes. And they had both male and female 
prostitutes in all the famous temples in the first century. And uh, many of the churches in the, in, the New, in, in the New Testament came from that background. And that's why it became a big issue in the church. Okay? I will come to that at the end of my message. Let me stay in Jude for a little while, you know, to show how, how seriously Jude took this. All right? There are three, three things, three examples that Jude shows us to prove his point. Do you have Bible with you? I want you to open to this little book of Jude. Okay. And verse 11. That's only one chapter, okay? In verse 11. He mentions three people and three phrases. I'm going to stay there for a little while to show why this is so important, why Jude was so passionate about it. Verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way... He's talking about people who embrace this liberalism, you know, and, and at the same time claim to be Christians. And this is what he says. For they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So three phrases there. What are the three phrases? Look at that verse carefully. What are the three phrases? The way of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. So we're going to look at that uh, for a little bit, all right? Now, what was the way of Cain? We all know the story of Cain and Abel if you grew up in a, in a Christian atmosphere. The, uh, Cain and Abel, both of them were children of Adam and Eve, and uh, they learned how to worship God from Adam and Eve. And, and how did Adam and Eve learn to worship God? From God himself, by God himself. Because uh, in the redemption story, we read that uh, before they were kicked out from the Garden of Eden, God actually covered them with the skin of the animals. So where did the skin of the animals come from? It was from a sacrifice. God showed them how to offer a sacrifice, how to kill a lamb and offer it as a sacrifice for their sins, and then gave them the skin of that animal, which they used as uh, their cloth. So they knew about how to please God through sacrifices. And Adam and Eve had taught that to Cain and Abel. And Abel followed that. And we see the story of Cain and Abel coming to worship God. Now, what was the way of Cain? This, was the, this is the, the story. The, Cain decided to worship God as he pleased. Listen to me. Cain said, uh, I'm going to worship God the way I want. Nobody is going to tell me how to worship God. I don't care if God showed us a way to worship him. I don't care if God showed us how to conduct a sacrifice. I'm not going to go with that. I'm going to go with the, my own way. I'm going to follow my own thinking. So what happened? He came into the presence of God. Both of them, both brothers came to worship. And uh, Abel came with a lamb from, from the flock he had. And Cain was a farmer. So instead of uh, gain, giving some of his grain to his brother and getting a lamb and as a barter, and offering that lamb as a sacrifice, he decided to offer some of his grain and some of his vegetables on the altar. And, uh, uh, and, and, and he offered his own sacrifice. And he said, listen, God should be happy. I'm doing something. You know, that was, the, that was his attitude. God should be happy. I'm doing something. I'm not following God 100%, but I, at least I'm doing something. God should be, ha should be happy with it. And we know the story. God was not happy with it. So what is the way of Cain? Way of Cain is personal interpretation for spiritual matters. Personal interpretation for spiritual matters. See, this is Bible. You know, there was so much confusion in the world, right? Based on this book today. Even though this is the revelation of God. And you know where does the conf confusion come from? Confusion comes from personal interpretation of the word of God. Now, why is that a wrong thing? Do I not do the same thing? When I am preaching like this, am I not interpreting the Bible? Yes, I am. So how can I say my interpretation is right and somebody else's interpretation is wrong? Well, this is the simplest way to do that. Okay, simplest method to do that. 
There's something called exegesis. In theology, that process is called exegesis. Now, exegete means pull out. That's what it means. Pull out something. Okay? That's what it means. Now, uh, uh, a couple of examples I can give you. One will be squeezing out the honey from a honeycomb. See, the honey is in there, but it's no use to you until you squeeze it out from that honeycomb. Okay? That is exegete. So the way to interpret Bible, the right way to interpret Bible is to interpret Bible with the Bible. See, there's a verse in the, in the book of Deuteronomy where God told long time ago through Moses that uh, search in my scriptures. I forgot to write down uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, reference. God said, uh, search in my book. You, there will, you will always find Every scriptural truth in the Bible is supported by at least two verses. At least two verses. Okay? So you, you, we cannot make a scriptural truth or a scriptural interpretation based on just one scripture passage. Okay, let me give you a for example. There's a passage in the Bible, one story in the Bible, where Jesus told a young man, Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And you search through all of the Bible and you will see that God, Jesus said that only one time to only one person. So if there is only one mention of it, that's a special, specific circumstances. It's not a universal principle. Jesus does not expect all of us to sell everything that we have and give it to the poor. In other words, there was a reason why he said this to this young man. I don't have time to go into the details because Jesus wanted to lift him up to an extremely high spiritual level. Jesus was so pleased with this young man and he was going to elevate him above his own disciples. But the young man didn't understand the, what Jesus was doing. So he went away unwilling to give up his earthly possessions. So when you see something like that, mentioned only one time in the Bible, it is never universally acceptable. It's never a universal principle. God did that on a special occasion to a specific person or a specific group of people. But if it is mentioned at least twice in the Bible, then it's applicable. Then it's applicable to everyone. Then it becomes a universal principle. That's, the way, that's what God told Moses. This is not my idea. This is what God told Moses. He said, Moses, tell your people, search through the scriptures. And when you search through the scriptures, if you, find, you will always find a corollary to everything I'm saying. You will see something to, sup, not corollary, something to support, you know, to what I'm saying. And that's how things become universally acceptable. Amen? But when, I, when you do exegesis, or when you pull out the truth, you squeeze out the truth, truth, and you make sure it is in line with the rest of the Bible. If what you are saying is in line with the rest of the Bible, then your interpretation of the Bible is right. Then your interpretation of the Bible is right. But if what you are saying is not in line with the rest of the Bible, then your interpretation is wrong. And you must be willing to quit it. Okay? Now, a lot of wrong doctrines have come into church because... People refuse to follow the simple principle of the interpretation of the Bible. Okay, uh, uh, um, my message is not theology today, so let's come back to the story of uh, Cain. So what was the, what was the fallacy of, in the thinking of Cain? Cain wanted to give his own interpretation. He said, what is the difference? I'm a farmer. So since I'm a farmer, I'm going to offer vegetables as my sacrifice. My brother is a sheep herder. Herder, so he's going to give a lamb as a sacrifice. God should be equally pleased with both. But God wasn't. God wasn't. In our world today, we have the same problem. People say, you worship God your way. I worship God my way. Amen? And they say, there's no difference. You're worshiping God, I am worshiping God. 
If God is willing to accept your worship, he should be willing to accept my worship too. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. God has shown us how to worship him. Amen? Do you know who made that first argument? I mean, not, not, not first time. First time it was Cain. But another famous story in the Bible, a person who made that argument is the, is the Samaritan woman. Remember, she was talking directly to Jesus. And what was her argument? She said, hey, you worship God on that mountain, which she meant Jerusalem mountain, and we worship God on this mountain, by which she meant uh, Gerasim mountain in, uh, in, in Samaria. So she said, okay, you have a worship place on a mountain top. We have a worship place on a mountain top. You guys offer sacrifice there. We guys offer sacrifice here. So what's the difference? We are all worshiping the same God. Did Jesus buy that? No. What was Jesus, what was the answer that Jesus gave to her? Jesus said, you, you know, it doesn't matter whether you worship in this mountain or this mountain. Both of them are equally of no value. My father seeks them who will worship him in truth and in spirit. That's the only worship that Jesus accepts. Amen? That's the only worship that God accepts. So when we come into the presence of God, worship is an offering. Amen? We are here. Just our presence here itself is an offering to God this morning. Amen? And we came here. We woke up this morning. And we go dressed up. And we got out in the cold weather. And we came here. And God considered us as a worship you know, offering from your part. But when you come here, we must worship him the way it is revealed in his word. It's very, very important. Amen? So, today... We live in a day and age of personal spirituality. You know who is the biggest proponent of this? I am not, I don't like to talk, mention names on the, because they are videotaping this. Um, but the biggest proponent of that, who made that so popular, unfortunately, is opera. And we know opera shut as a Christian lady. But now she's not a Christian lady. If any of you have any inkling that she's not a Christian lady listen to her programs? She's not. Her theology has completely become new age. And she say personal spirit, she always promote personal spirituality. You believe in what you want to believe and you believe in what you want to believe. As long as you believe in something, it's fine. That's not true. <laughs> That's very dangerous. Amen? Now, let me ask you a simple question, right? It's a very simple question. Suppose you have a rat poison. You know, you have a rat infestation in your house and you went out and bought rat poison, right? And, uh, and you look at it and it looks like dark chocolate. And, and will you ever take that and say, I believe this is dark chocolate. And because I believe this is dark chocolate, it is dark chocolate. And put it in your mouth. You know what will be the end, right? But unfortunately, when it comes to spiritual matters, that's what people think. Amen? Today you hear this phrase, your truth is your truth. I mean, so many people, when you go out and share the gospel with people, people will say, that's your truth. My truth is different from your truth. Like, there are many different truths. There's only one truth. Amen? And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the one who said, I am the truth. Amen. Amen. And the way, and the light. And he is the truth. There's only one truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Until and unless we come to him, we are not walking in truth. So that's why we have to stand up against the ways of Cain in the world today. Liberalism in the form of way of Cain. Second thing is the error of Balaam. I'll move on faster, okay? Um, the story of Balaam we find in the book of Numbers. And uh, Balaam was a prophet, a seer, more than a prophet, a seer. And uh, he was able to see um, in, into the spiritual realm. Now, uh, there is a, a, a question, how can a Gentile person be a seer and talk about God? We do not know uh, fully. Maybe he, in his spiritual curse, he had some encounter with God. Anyway, the, a, a, a king named Balak 
brought this man to curse the nation of Israel. And he said, um, and we know he was a Gentile seer from the way he conducted his seances. Uh, we see that he goes to top of a mountain and he burns incense and he offers a sacrifice. And then he is doing that, during while he is doing that seance, you know, he gets the revelation and he will give it to the people. And he was very famous for that. So this king brought him there and, gave, and promised him a lot of silver and gold. You know, the only, con, uh, only, only commitment on his part was make sure what comes out of your mouth is curse against this group of people. And uh, Balaam came, did the first seance, and uh, words started coming out from his mouth, oracle started coming out from his mouth, but it was not curse. He started blessing the nation of Israel and started saying good things about the nation of Israel. And the king became very angry. He said, I brought you here to curse these people. Why are you doing this? And he said, it's not working. Maybe I go to the next mountain and conduct this, repeat this there. Maybe it will work. So the king said, okay, I'll set up everything for you on that mountain. So he went to the top of the next mountain, did the whole thing, and the oracle started coming, and uh, he couldn't curse. It was again blessing for the nation. And he went to the third place, you know, again. And the king finally was getting angry. <laughs> so he, you know, he has to please the king. King can in a tank kill somebody, right? So he had to please the king. He said, okay, let's try one more time. Let's go to a third mountain top and uh, a more elaborate setup. And maybe I'll be able to do that. So he did that puja, you know, that uh, offering the siya and the whole thing. And the words came out. And what came out from his mouth was this. How can I curse somebody whom God has not cursed? I wanted to make a note of that. I wanted to make a note of that. It doesn't matter what the enemy is trying to do against you. It doesn't matter how many witchcraft things are done against you. It doesn't matter how many voodoo stuff you come across. If God has encouraged you, nobody can touch you. Amen? Hallelujah. Nobody can touch you. You will be protected by God. He said, hey, this is a, a group of people, a nation that lives alone. In other words, you know what, what he was saying? As long as these people maintain their separation, nothing can touch them. See, God called us out from the world. That's what, uh, that's what it means. Disciple is a called out person. We are the disciples of Jesus. God has called us out of the world. Amen. And in the book of Ephesians and, the, and many other places, it says you are just like them, which is true about the first century Christians and which is also true about us. There is nothing different from us versus the people out in the world. And, and there is only difference is that God in his mercy chose to call us out from there and made us a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own children, amen, and put us together as a body which is called the church. And we are part of this church today. And God expects this church to be, to remain a called out group. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. If I am talking a little strong, don't get upset. I'm just telling the truth. God expects us to remain the called out one. If there is no difference between us and the people outside, then how can we call ourselves the called out ones? So the problem with the Old Testament Israel, at that time it was not a problem. The good thing that was going for the Old Testament Israel at that time was they remained the called out ones. Where were they called out from? From Egypt. And they had gone through that Passover, which is a symbol of the salvation experience. And then they went through the Red Sea, which is a symbol of the baptism experience. And then they were walking under the cloud that God provided for them, which represented the presence of God in their lives. And they continued to live like that. And, and they, were, they were a holy nation. They were a called out people. A royal priesthood for God. And therefore, the, even though Balaam was a very powerful spiritual person, he could conduct seances after seances, but he couldn't touch them. Amen? As long as you and I live at the way God has called us out to live, nothing in this world will touch us. Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus said, no harmful thing will come upon you in the end of Mark chapter 16. 
Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus said, even if you take a, even if you, a serpent will bite you, nothing will happen to you. It, he didn't mean to go and pick up a serpent. What he is saying is, my protection is upon your life. It doesn't matter what comes against you. We know that the serpent represents Satan in, this, in the scriptures. And he, what he was saying was, Satan can try his best. Hallelujah. Satan can try his best. But you will come out on the top. Amen. Amen. Because I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. Hallelujah. This morning, if you are, a, if you are hounded by enemy in any area of your life, whether it is your physical health, whether it is your mental health, whether it is uh, the oppression in your spirit, Amen. Whether it is binding up your finances, whether it is you know, binding up your progress in life, it doesn't matter what the enemy is trying against you. I, can, I have a word for you from the Lord this morning. He will not succeed if you stick with God. He can only succeed when you stop walking with the Lord. Hallelujah. And that's a failure, unfortunately, that happened to this same group of people. When Balaam found out that he couldn't do anything against them in the spiritual realm, his crooked mind started working because he wanted to get the silver and gold the king had offered. And he said, why should I lose the silver and gold? I don't care how good Israel is, how noble Israel is. I don't care. I want to get my silver and gold. So he went to King Balak and said, uh, hey, there is one area where you can defeat them. This is not from God. This is from my brain. But let me tell you how you can defeat them. And he went to the king Balak and said, uh, these people are coming, came out of uh, Egypt a long, long time ago, and they haven't, been, they haven't mingled with anyone. They're just walking alone through the desert like a nomad group. And so I am pretty sure all the young men in their group are desperate to meet some pretty young ladies. So why don't you have a huge party? and invite all the young men from Israel to come. And when they come, let them do whatever they want. Don't hold anything back. You know, King Balak wanted to see Israel destroyed. You know, he wanted to make sure that they don't go and establish themselves as a nation. So that's exactly what he did. The next sentence, or next couple of sentences down, you see the, the, the Israelite young men and the and the young ladies from the kingdom of Balak, they were mixing up and they're having, you know, free, free love, as the hippies used to say in the 60s. Sounds, does it matter? Will be the question today? Yes, it did matter. In two areas it mattered. It says there in one day 25,000 of the young men died. Why? Because they were having you know, sexual intercourse with the, this. This, is, this was a heathen society. Listen, can I be a little, little free here? It's only adults here, right? Not, not kids here, right? I have 10 minutes left. Uh, I, I know you're a kid, but um, okay, don't listen to me now. All right. <laughs> uh, now um, you, know what, you know what was happening? See, there is something about STDs. See, there are certain society in, societies in the world where you know, freelance sexual relationships were the norm, norm for many generations. And over many generations, everyone's body built up antibodies against it. So they don't get affected by it. Okay? They can survive. But when you come from a community come from a community where that was not the norm. It was one woman, one man. You know, the biblical pattern was a norm. And then you go and start having relations with somebody from that community. Guess what? All those things. There's no antibody against that in your body because you didn't grow up in that community. You were not born in that community. You were not conceived in that community. So from, from, from the... Uh, from from the womb itself, they start developing antibodies against that. So they can survive, but you cannot survive. This is a simple biological truth. So when the nation of Israel, who kept their separation, 
only married within that race. No, race is not the issue. I'm talking about the community. Community. And they maintained that suppression. And all of a sudden came in relationship with this free society where everyone was doing whatever with everyone else. All the sicknesses that they had got unto them. And they died because of high fever. And that high fever was caused by the STDs they picked up from this group of people. And that's not the only time it has happened in history. I do not have the freedom to keep talking like this. Time is short, and we have something else to do. Uh, but that's how Alexander died. You know that? Emperor Alexander died that way. Because he went, he went into the, some of the Asian nations where the, and went into the temples there. You know, earlier I said temple prostitution. And he went into the, he used to, he has a pantheist. So he would go to every temple and offer something. And whatever they gave, he would take it. And some temples offered him more than the prasad. Gave him the girls too. So he would go into the temple prostitutes and how relationship. He, he forgot, he's the emperor. He said, okay, this is part of this worship system. So I'm going to do with it. And he died out of high fever. Do you know where the high fever came from? From the STDs that he picked up from the temples. A third example, when uh, Christian missionaries, this happened in the 19th century. When Christian, in the 19th century was the missionary century. Christian missionaries started going all over the world. When they went to the area called Polynesia, Polynesia is uh, Hawaii all the way, those islands all the way down to, down to Australia and Fiji. You know, that when they were going to those islands as missionaries, Many of these islands were very free society. You know, they had no moral qualms about uh, anything because they were all fishermen societies. And sometimes their men go into the sea to, you know, for, and they don't see them for months. So they made it a rule that if your husband is out for months in the, in the ocean, then you are free to do whatever with somebody else. And that became a, uh, that kind of societies were lived in those, in those islands. You know, many of the Christian missionaries fell for that. Because when they went there, they were so surprised. When the ship come, the ladies will jump into the ocean naked and swim around the... Swim. I'm talking... This is one of the mission books I'm talking about. Swim around the, their ships naked. And guess what is going to happen next? And guess what is going to happen after that? They picked up everything that they were carrying, and many of the missionaries died. Went for a noble cause, but died. The error of Balaam. That error is so widely accepted in the world today. We know that, uh, so we know that uh, the, it, is, it is perverting. Now, something I'm going to say, you know, don't take it wrong. The Muslim fundamentalists call us, the nation of America, the big Satan. Do you know why they call big Satan? And they never, they never did that before? In the 50s, until the 50s, America was the friend of the entire Muslim world. And Muslim world used to respect America because what went into the world from America was missionaries and Bibles and charity. In the 60s, when the hippism came, it started changing. Now today, you know what goes into Muslim nations? Still charity goes. But no missionaries don't go much anymore. But you know what goes from here? Pornography goes from here. You know who controls internet? All the major ar architecture of internet is in America. It's in America. An organization called ICANN controls all that architecture. And it is through internet all this filth is going into the, uh, the rest of the world. So many parts of the world, people look at America as a source of filth today, not as a source of godliness. Now we know that their interpretation is not 100% right. America still has a lot of, in fact, millions of godly people, but they don't see it. And they don't get to see it. They, what they get to see is what comes down. The movies that, uh, that, um, that Hollywood is producing. Right? And, uh, and, and, and the television shows 
that, uh, that come, which you cannot see anymore with a family. It's so amazing. You cannot, from 8 to 10, you cannot sit together as a family and watch a television show on, on any of the main channels because it's so polluted. And I told you I want, one day, I don't know whether it's here or in the Bible study, that uh, our current Secretary of State went into Africa, poor nations of Africa, and said, uh, we will not give you any more money unless you pass a law legalizing gay marriage. I'm telling you the truth. She went to uh, African nations and said that. One of the nations, Sierra Leone, you know, which is a, at the present is a Christian. And he said, uh, we may not be Polish like you guys are in America. Thank God we are fashionable. We are not fashionable enough to accept when our son comes home and tells us that we have married another boy. He said, we don't want your support. They turned down the financial support. Error of Bella. It's so prevalent in the world today. And guess what? Why we had to stand up against this? Human society is going to be destroyed. Amen? As a result of that, it, 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 will, it will lead to moral breakdown of the entire human society. And it will lead to pervading sickness in the camp. And God's judgment is what is going to happen. Amen. Let me come quickly to the conclusion of my message. The third thing that Jude spoke against was the gainsaying of uh, Korah, or rebellion of Korah. And Korah was, a, this is another story. Korah was a cousin of Moses, you know. And uh, in, the, in Leviticus chapter 6, I believe, it gives us the breakdown of what each family was supposed to do. God said, this is what Moses' family going to do. This is, Moses' family didn't do much, actually. You know, the Aaron's family did. And all the key positions in ministry was given to Aaron's family. And the Korah's family ended up carrying the tabernacle on their shoulder, setting up the tabernacle somewhere, etc. And they were very upset that they didn't get the limelight. Okay? So then all of a sudden later, they started a rebellion against, uh, uh, against Moses. Now, listen to me, okay, very carefully. They started a rebellion against Moses under uh, Numbers chapter 14. Talks about that. They said uh, they have started a rebellion against Moses saying that he has married an Ethiopian woman. Now, we don't know when Moses married an Ethiopian woman. I don't know. Sometimes when the word Ethiopian is, is in the Bible, it simply, say, it simply is synonymous with the black. Today, we're like we say, a black person. Okay? So maybe what, he, they, what they are saying is that Moses did not marry a, a Jewish woman. Remember, he, he married the, the daughter of a Gentile priest. So maybe she was black in color. I don't know. I don't know. Okay? But they all of a sudden, and this is many years after Moses' own marriage. So all of a sudden, we had a big issue in the camp. And they said, you cannot be, say, oh, you are all that and some. You know, because we know whom you marry. Why are you putting yourself up above us? Big confusion in the camp. And the God took care of that. But I want to tell you why it's wrong. What was actually happening? See, what they were trying to do was they were trying to take advantage of a situation. So what Jude is fighting against is, or telling us to stand up against is the taking advantage of situations. Now, in the spiritual realm today, look at, look at what is happening today. The Eastern religions, Hinduism, is the number one culprit in that. As soon as Christianity started going down in the West, what happened? Hinduism came. Right? And infiltrated all the universities, all the universities in the, world, uh, in the West, and became a topic of study, right? In the, in, in the West. And uh, how uh, influenced most of the younger generation. Now, they use yoga as a means to do that, right? And you go and ask the gurus, and guru has become an English word now. <laughs> Why? Because they have so much influence. What did they actually do? They came and took advantage of a situation where the Christian faith started getting weak in the West and they came and took advantage and became entrenched in this community. And when I drive around, I go to get something from McDonald's or Wendy's or something in you know, near where I live, I am so shocked to see so many yoga studios 
It's like every block has a yoga studio. I said, how do they stay in business? How many people go for this? They have become so entrenched. And you can go to any school and study that today, right? The same school where they, where they say, you cannot bring a Bible. Right? Where they say, you cannot, the kids cannot get together and, and pray. They say, you cannot have a prayer club in the school. You can have a yoga club in the school. So what happened? Taking advantage. And, you, and, uh, and Jude said, as Christians, we must stand against this kind of trends in the world. When you see people taking advantage of situation, instead of uh, praying for Christianity to come back, so people come in and take advantage of that. So what are we supposed to do? We as a Christian nation should uh, stand up against uh, such things. Amen? And we must pray against those things. Hallelujah. Because we know that God can bring this nation back. God can bring the India Western nations back. Because he promised us in 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called my name will humble themselves and call upon my name. I will come and heal their land. We must be healing agents. We must seek spiritual healing for the, our generation. Hallelujah. And uh, two more things I want to show you before I sit down. Or, or continue with the rest, uh, the rest of our today's program. Uh, and then Jude tells us what happens when you, why you should avoid this. He gives, a, uh, he highlights Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding cities. Now, you all know Sodom and Gomorrah, right? What was their sin? What is he uh, associated with? But I, want, I don't think you know the full story. Listen to me. Can I take five more minutes? Okay. You, I do not know whether you know the full story. See, when you, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10, when you look first see Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, oh, it didn't, it's not working? Okay, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah was like the Garden of Eden. It was like the Garden of Eden, it says. It was a, such a fertile land, such a wealthy nation. Amen? Now, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49 tells us what happened to them. This is why you have to pay attention to it. It says that it led to pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. It's a very interesting phrase. Pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. You know what he's saying? They became too wealthy. And look at this, look at this. If you look, if you follow the social evils that we were discussing, you know, I don't know why they brought the children back, but uh, uh, so I have to be careful what I'm saying. Um, now, uh, if you follow the, the story of social evil, you will see that it always comes from wealthy nations. Because in the poor nation, people are struggling to make a living. They don't have time to go after all this nonsense. And it doesn't even enter into their mind. You know why? Because they don't have idle time. <laughs> when you don't have to work so hard to make a living, when you have too much free time, right? Every parent knows that. If the kids have too much free time on their hand, mischief comes. But it only not only happens to the kids, it also happens to adults. Amen? So if you follow the history of social evil, you will see that it always comes from West, I mean, not West, the wealthy nations. Amen? In the ancient world, you know where it happened? In the Greek culture, it happened. Before that, it happened in the Egypt. When Egypt was at the top, it happened in Egypt. Then when Greek, Greece became the top, it happened in Greek culture. In the Romans, when the Romans ruled the world, they were the worst. You can go home and read from history. I don't have time. And then Jeremiah says that uh, in chapter 23 about Sodom, that nobody wanted to turn away from their wickedness. In other words, they didn't care. Things were happening. They were wealthy. They were wealthy. They had everything. So they didn't care. They had a lot of idleness. Idle time on the hand. So they just lived for pleasure. And when you live just for pleasure, the corruption happens. Your mind changes. And you don't care about anything other than pleasure. And you know what happens to you? Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, so many times, God repeat one phrase. God said, I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. Cities overthrowing happens. In other words, God will knock you down. Look in history. What happened to Egypt? At one time, 
It was the greatest civilization in the world, right? But then it disappeared. That civilization disappeared. What happened to Greece? They gave us the philosophy. They gave us Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, everyone else. But for a long time, they were in decline. Even now, they're in decline. We know that uh, all the commotion that's going on there, they cannot even afford to buy bread anymore. What happened to Rome? Ruled the entire world, but knocked down from history. Amen? The same thing is going to happen to the West. Take this as a prophecy. If this nation and Canada, European nations, don't turn around and seek God again, just like God knocked down Rome, just like God knocked down Greece, just like God knocked down Egypt, God will knock down this nation also. Because God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. God is on the side of people who seek him. Amen? Hallelujah. Corruption will destroy. Hallelujah. Corruption will destroy the churches. Amen? Hallelujah. And we know today, and the, the liberalism that I have been talking about has entered into churches, right? And we know, I don't even want to talk in detail anymore. You know what is happening in all the mainline denominations. They have gone so far out in diluting the word of God and, 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 uh, and even declaring whoever can be the priest, whoever can be the bishops. You know what I am talking about. And they said, we don't care. We follow our own line of thinking. And then they come up with personal interpretation. They will always use Bible to justify what they are doing. That is what liberalism does. Guess what is going to happen to those churches? People leave those churches because a church becomes powerless when a church embraces liberalism. A nation becomes morally powerless when a nation embraces liberalism. Nobody has the guts to stand up to anything anymore. If you don't believe me, go to London today, go to England today. You will see that this mighty nation, that little nation, you know, that ruled the entire world. Today, nobody has a gut to stand up for anything because they embrace liberalism. And Jude said, before it happens to you, before it happens to your church, stand up for your faith. Stand up for the truth of the word of God and God will honor you and God will strengthen you. God will back you up and you will see God's purposes established in your life, in your family, in your church, in your nation. That's what God expects us to do. Close your eyes with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before your word this morning.